What's up, YouTube? It's Rico here. I'm the CEO of Source Fine Asia, co-host of Bain Channel Podcast, and the host of the Source Fine Asia YouTube channel. Back with another, another one. one. Again, this is like one of the first videos I'm doing of my new Canon 77D DSLR. So I'm going to be doing a lot more night shoots, on location shoots. I mean, I do a lot of on location stuff, but like this allows me to be flexible. We've got the two cameras going at the same time. Yeah. So in this particular video, I'm talking about how to negotiate price with your supplier and how to deal with price increases. Yeah. <clears throat> hey, look, a quarter century, they asking me what's next. Hand me the keys, please. My life no get formula one set. Moving fast, either play catch up or be left for dead. All the pressure mounting on me. Will it ever rest? Not seen a lot of years, but some have been cruel. Seen niggas who hate the sunset cause they have no place to dwell. Know who to trust, but tell me how can you tell? Some of them pray you fail. I wish you well, make it be thrill. See, wish I could go back a couple years. The younger years, running around with cousins, sniffing on grandma's tobacco leaves. Getting chased out neighbor's house for climbing up a mango trees. The innocent years before we knew black. Alright, so the first part that I'm gonna cover is sort of the negotiation process because this is universal whether you're dealing with a price increase with a supplier that you've worked with before or you're just doing research with factories for the first time. I always say the first thing about China is cheap is expensive, right? So this is the biggest mis misconception. Everybody thinks that if you're going to make a product in China, it's going to be dirt cheap. I was just having a conversation with my business partner, Mike, the other day and, and think about this. The camera that I'm using to record this on, my iPhone XS, I, my MacBook Pro, these are all things that were manufactured in China. These are some of the most expensive electronics that you can buy, right? And they're all made in China. At the same time, you could easily buy a knockoff, uh, you know, DSLR Chinese uh, model for, you know, $50, $100, and chances are the quality isn't going to be the best and the material might be flimsy and it might fall apart and all that stuff. So it's really what you make of it. It's either you're going to go for the, the you know, low end stuff and try to save a ton of money, or you're gonna go for the high-end stuff. And if you go cheap, it could be expensive because the thing might break down and then you have to replace it. Or you, like if, for example, you have to deal with returns if you're selling this on a, on a mass scale. So that's why I say cheap is expensive. So the, the first thing that I, I like to do is when I'm talking to factories for the first time or when my team is talking to factories for the first time, we don't necessarily bring up price. I think getting as many quotations as possible, talking to as many suppliers as possible is going to be the best thing to do at, at the beginning because what always happens is if you get 20 quotations for example you'll have five that are ridiculously expensive you're going to have five that are ridiculously cheap and then the other 10 the, the bulk the medium is going to be somewhere in the middle within you know will be relatively similar in terms of prices and that usually gives you an idea of what the average is if you look at the most expensive the least expensive and then the average then you'll have an idea of, of what you're dealing with and then from there if you have that data you can now approach each factory and say hey i got a quotation from you let's say you're talking to the most expensive factory on the, on the list and saying hey i got a quotation that's 50 percent cheaper than your per unit cost why and then you start to understand. Another thing is if you understand the process, if you know what kind of product you're trying to make. So let's say if you want to make a very high-end product, you're probably going to have to pay a slightly premium for that price. If you're trying to do the average product, you might be able to get away with working with, with one of the lower quality factories, but then you, I mean the cheaper factories, but then you have to make sure that the quality is what they say it is. I always think when it comes to negotiation in China, having multiple quotes and then going approaching a factory that's already close to the per unit cost that you want it to be is much easier than trying to get a factory to lower their per unit cost significantly. If I'm trying to sell a product for X price, or I'm trying to buy a product for X price, and then I find a factory that's 50% or 100% more expensive, it's a waste of time to try to get them to lower their per unit cost by 50%. But if I find a factory that's you know, 10% more expensive than what I'm willing to pay or 15% more expensive than what I'm willing to pay. It's a little bit easier for them to bring down the, the per unit cost. So you're already negotiating from a strong point. I think most factories are used to clients trying to get the price lower. But then of course, the best option is always to try to find a factory that's already within your price range. So let's say you find a factory that's significantly cheaper, 
then you approach them and say, hey, you know, why is your product so much less expensive than you know, X, Y, and Z factory? And they might say, well, this is a different material or we have a more efficient system in terms of how we put the product together. And then you have to now clarify with them that the quality that you're trying to go for is exactly what they're producing. So, you know, that's like a, a sort of pro tip that you could use from the, from the negotiation standpoint at the beginning. And I think another aspect with negotiation is never, never oversell yourself. I think a big mistake that people make when they're approaching Chinese factories is they feel like they have to make themselves look like they're a giant company. That can also be a detriment. Like if you make yourself look like you're a big company, they might be like, well, you have the money, right? Uh, so that's, a, that's another aspect. Sometimes approaching them and, and, and telling them that you're a small company or a startup is actually going to be beneficial in terms of saving costs. And a lot of times, sometimes if the factories believe in your, in your product or they like you as a, as a business and they want to work with you and develop your, the relationship, they'll sometimes take a, an L in their initial order. I remember one of our first ODM projects, um, the first product we made with the fact we kind of went to the factory and we laid out what the the grand scheme was the grand plan so the first order was going to be this much in six months we're going to place another order for x amount and then we're going to do other designs and basically they ended up they said they lost money but in my opinion i'm pretty sure they were profitable in the first order they underpriced the first order because they wanted our business um, and so then, you know, in the, on the future orders, when we placed uh, other designs, when we made other products with them that were similar, the, the, the prices were a little bit higher. But um, because we had already set that benchmark, they couldn't really go too much further up. So, you know, and then of course our orders increased in price, I mean, in, in quantity. So our price ended up going lower than the original quotes. So that's a, that's a big part of it is as well as just making sure that, you know, you establish a good relationship with them in the beginning. Some factories will then, give you the benefit of the doubt and give you a lower cost now in the hopes that in the future your orders are going to be bigger. Another thing with that is maybe sometimes approach a factory that doesn't, hasn't broken into the foreign market yet as much because a lot of those factories are desperate to get more foreign clients and I'm, it's not exactly as prevalent as it was say 10 years ago. A lot of factories now want to focus on the domestic market because if they sell within China uh, it's easier for them from a quality standpoint, uh, communication standpoint, like everything's just easier for them. But there are still a lot of factories out there, maybe newer ones, maybe factories that have sort of been selling in the domestic market and can't compete with some of the larger companies that have come into, come into the domestic market. They want to expand and they want to work with foreign clients. And they are willing to you know, negotiate price and get, give you lower quotations. And, and, and things like that. Those are the factories that I would try to aim for is finding a factory that maybe doesn't have that much experience and they're looking at you as their golden ticket into Australia or you know um, France or you know the, the US or Canada. So like those are the kind of factories I try to aim to get and the way you find those factories not necessarily on Alibaba because I think a lot of the factories that are already listed on Alibaba are already hip to you know the foreign market 1688.com which is you know the it's the local alibaba so this is for factories that deal with chinese companies within china the only issue with that is usually the 1688.com factories don't speak any english they don't have any english speaking staff so again you're going to be like pulling them into the foreign way of doing business so if you're new to doing business in China, I wouldn't necessarily recommend starting off on a platform like 1688, but it is a good way to find the kind of suppliers that I was talking about. So that being said, in terms of setting up the ne negotiations, those would be the best ways to approach that. I think when it comes to the actual negotiation process, like when you sit down with a factory, negotiating in China is a trial of contrition. What I mean by trial of contrition, it's more about who's going to give up first. <laughs> and uh, in Chinese business culture, there's, there's more of a win-lose mentality, whereas in you know Western business, it's more of a win-win, like how does this work on both sides? And I'll, of course, I'm generalizing. A lot of factories have began to change that mentality, but I think even for the factories, if they sort of budge on price significantly, they feel like they're lost. Even if they don't say it or they don't express it like that, they'll feel like they lost. So, and then a lot of factories just won't even, won't budge for a very long time. One of my other philosophies I think about China is like everything is negotiable. So 
if you have MOQs that are too high, then you can negotiate the MOQs down or you can increase the pre-unit cost to lower the MOQs. There's always a way around certain issues. Of course, you want to start off, as I mentioned at the top of this, you don't want to start, you want to start off from a strength of position, so you don't want to be starting off so far away from your target price. If you're really, really strict about price, you also have to be prepared to walk away. So what I usually do is when I'm dealing with negotiations on behalf of my clients, I ask them to give me a set of criteria. So here's the target price that you want, right? Here's what we're gonna start off with. And if this happens, then this. So if the factory is not willing to come down to your target price, are you gonna be willing to accept this? If they're not willing to come down to your target price, are we walking away? So of course I try to set that criteria because I'm negotiating on behalf of my clients. And like I said, if you're really, really adamant about it, it's like you gotta be prepared to walk away from the factory. Another thing is uh, because of the way, you know, Chinese business culture is set up and Asian business culture as a, as a whole, Eastern business culture, face-to-face -face negotiation is gonna be the best. Negotiating with somebody on Skype, like it's just, you don't, there isn't the same level of emotion and intensity. And also when you physically go to the factory, it shows that you're serious and you can also demand, not demand, but you can request for you know, more senior management to be a part of the negotiation process. Because if you're talking to a salesperson, which usually is the case if you find them on Alibaba or, or whatever, the initial person you're talking to is typically a salesperson. They don't necessarily have the authority to come down on pricing that much. They're going to have to go and talk to their boss. So when I visit factories a lot of times, and, I, and the specific purpose of the, that meeting is price negotiation, I'm trying to get their sales manager in the room or at least somebody else who has seniority where they can actually come down on price. Otherwise, it's like, it's kind of a waste of time and you're gonna spend so much time talking to this person who then has to then report it up the chain. So that's a very, very big point is like, you waste a lot of time if you're negotiating with a sales person rather than, you know, the actual, you know, uh, sales manager or whoever is above the sales manager. Sometimes it might take a couple meetings. I think the longest we ever had price negotiation before was, uh, was for Prodigy game toys when we were making, I think it was the last batch of toys. It was about four designs. The factory had shot up their price significantly. This is gonna help me transition into, into the next part of this. We started off negotiating via WeChat. <laughs> it was first my team, then uh, my team, my, myself and the sales manager. Then it was just me and the sales manager. Then, and this is over the course of about a week. So we're going back and forth, back and forth about pricing. And then we ended up going to the factory on a Monday, sitting down with them for four hours. They came down, we went back, spoke to, came down on pricing slightly. We went back, spoke to my, my client, went back again on Wednesday, came down and I finally got the, the pricing that we were looking for. Actually, I, I had this moment captured on the day in the life. Uh, I think it was day in life, day two. But um, that leads me to my next point. So the negotiation process, not just negotiation, but like what happens if a factory tries to increase the price of your product. So this is what happened with, with the Prodigy situation. And, and I have uh, numerous examples of clients that have approached us and you know their factories have actually come up on pricing, even though their order is either more consistent or slightly larger. The two major excuses factories always come up with is labor cost increases and raw material cost increases. The labor cost thing is true, and the raw materials can also be true, but it's just, you have to look at the frequency. And this information is, is available online. Like I know the labor costs go up because I have to pay my staff more money. <laughs> Uh, but we already pay above minimum wage, we've always done that. But I, when, I, when I'm looking to hire new people, we notice you know, that the labor costs go up and then also we're always in touch with that just because of you know, the hiring practices that we have to follow. But typically with a labor cost increase, it's only gonna increase officially once a year. The government has kind of slowed down a little bit on, on increasing labor costs. But uh, you know, for, uh, for a solid, I would say three, four years there, it was pretty much going up once a year and the spikes were pretty large. I think the other difference is with factories, specifically right now, even if the official uh, minimum wage doesn't go up, 
the factories are having to pay their factory workers more money because there's more competition. It's easier now for migrant workers to not have to travel halfway across the country to get a job. They might just get a, a job at a factory that's closer to their hometown. And so a lot of times the factories are having issues keeping their workers. Also the younger generation of Chinese people don't necessarily want to work in factories. They want to work in offices. Even you know the, the people that were typically considered to be you know migrant workers, they want better benefits. They're more educated about the labor practices. They know that the factories, they know more about how much money the factories are making. They're just, because of how technologies move forward and how China's advanced itself, these people are more educated about all the things that I just mentioned. So there is more competition for factory workers and the benefits of the factory workers are going up. So it's not necessarily the labor cost in terms of wages, it's everything else. So that is true, but you can find out that information. So I always look at it like this. If a factory comes to us and says, labor costs have gone up, or raw material costs have gone up, what I do is I contact a bunch of other factories that we've worked with in the past, and I ask them, have the labor costs gone up? And I mean, I know I can find out the official information, but then the unofficial information in terms of what's actually going on on the ground, the only way to find that out is to physically be there or to have contacts in that area to ask, hey, by the way, uh, you know, have you, are you also experiencing the same thing in terms of it being more difficult to hire factory workers and the factory workers uh, having to pay them a higher salary or having to give uh, better benefits? And you know, then it's either a yes or a no. So when you're armed with that information, then you know that the factory's not bullshitting you. The second thing is with the raw material costs, again, this is something that you can research. You can contact raw material suppliers off of Alibaba and, and various other channels, 1688, and verify whether the, the costs have gone up. You can talk to other, other factories that you work with and verify whether the costs have gone up. We had that situation with them where they said that the labor costs had gone up, which I verified was true, but they also talked about the raw material costs going up. And then when I did my background research and spoke to raw material suppliers, <laughs> for the for the, it was just funny because I think they were shocked that we actually went through this process, because I, I remember having a conversation with them and saying like, yeah, so we contacted ten PVC suppliers. <laughs> anyway, so we ended up uh, contacting raw material suppliers. I think specifically it was it was the it was less the PVC. It was about the paint that we were using. So we contacted uh, PVC and paint suppliers, and the paint suppliers gave us quotations for the basically the amount of paint that we needed and it was lower than what the factory was, was saying. So then they came back and said, well, you know, it's not just about the actual raw materials, it's also about the process. So then we knew, okay, they're kind of bullshitting us. It's not like they're trying to cheat us, it's just, of course, there's directives from higher, hey, let's increase prices for the clients across the board. So what we did was, armed with the research that we'd done on actual raw material suppliers, and finding out what the truth was. Yes, the labor costs went up, but the raw material suppliers said that we could purchase the raw material ourselves for a lower price. We also researched a bunch of other toy factories and came back to our supplier and said, look, we want to continue working with you. We're not even requesting that, you know, you drop your prices. We just think that, look at what we've got in terms of quotes of other factories. And this is what you're trying to, you're trying to increase the per unit cost at us. So when it was all said and done, we ended up lowering our actual per unit cost because we had this, we were armed with this information. We went to them with five, six different quotations from other factories for the same product that were lower. And then we'd also done our research on, on the labor cost, on the labor market and the raw material cost. So the moral of the story here is, Take the time to get as much information as possible. So research as many factories as possible when you're initially searching. Start from a good position. So get a, a feel of what the market cost is for your product. Start from a good position. So you don't want to start from here and then you're trying to bring a factory. You don't want to start from here and then you're trying to bring the factory down to here. You want to start from somewhere here and then try to bring the factory down. Remember that almost everything is negotiable. So if the MOQ is high, you might be able to lower the MOQ by increasing the pre cost. If the pre cost is high, you know, vice versa. And then of course, when it comes to the actual negotiation process, being there face-to-face -face is crucial. It's always gonna be the best. Of course, you can do Skype calls, WeChat calls, but face-to-face -face is always the best. Be armed with, you know, research. So do your research and come to them with multiple quotations from other suppliers. If, if it's a labor cost issue, find out why the, the product is more expensive and then verify that information. So if it's labor costs, if it's 
the currency exchange, if it's raw materials, as I mentioned. Do your due diligence and find out whether that's actually true. And then be prepared to like set your limits. So if you're saying you want to bring the factory down by 20%, are you willing to accept 10%? Are you willing to accept five? Or are you ready to walk away? Those are the best ways to deal with price increases when you're dealing with a manufacturer, and those are the best ways to negotiate price down in general. Cheers. And if you like this kind of content, like, comment, share, subscribe, 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 and I will see you guys next week. To give up, we go survive. Shopping and make the way we go make them or die. Trying, dying to live another day, but soon we go to fly. 25 and still alive, we ain't made it this far to give up, we gon' survive Driving and make a way, we gon' make come or die Trying, dying and live another day, but soon we gonna fly